Good morning, church. I'd say it's good to see you this morning, but I guess I can't see you and you can see me. It's good to be seen, I guess. I have been diagnosed with COVID, so I've been sequestered in an, a, uh, a bunker in an undisclosed location somewhere in the Midwest for at least a week now. And I'm still hiding, hiding from a lot of people. My family is doing fairly well. My son now feels pretty badly too. And so if you don't mind praying for him as well, uh, but Elaine is uh, doing well and spoiling me rotten as she usually does. And uh, Julia's feeling well so far too. So, but anyway, so if you don't mind saying a prayer uh, for my son at least, and maybe for me to keep healing, it is, it is odd having this. A lot of the things people talk about having such as uh, being winded or it's heavy to, to breathe, hard to breathe. I feel that way when I go up down the stairs. I feel like an old man. That's crazy. Uh, and uh, that's weird. And uh, I have lost most of my sense of smell and taste. Not all of it. Probably 60%, I guess. And uh, that's weird. And I'm also pregnant. So that's, that's weird. I didn't expect that one. But anyway, we're praying for a healthy baby boy or girl. And I'm kidding. Uh, speaking of babies, what I want to do, if we can, uh, if you if you can hear me fine, is in the next uh, uh, four hours, I want to go over the the narratives of the birth of Jesus. Now, what we'll do is this week and next week and the next week, as we prepare for the birth of Jesus and the celebration of Christmas, I like for us to examine, if we can, uh, some of the portions of the birth narratives of Jesus. If, if you're like me, growing up in America, we've heard a lot of stories about Jesus um, from TVs, from movies, from church pageants and musicals and songs and on and on. There's a lot of church traditions or, or, or legends, that's a nice way of saying it, uh, that have arisen around the birth stories of Jesus that are simply just not there. And so I encourage you, every time you go back to read the birth narratives of Jesus, that you try to read it in its ancient context. And so, so what we'll do together, <coughs> sorry, what we'll do together is try to read our best in context. I like these kind of uh, crushes, these little birth narrative, birth Jesus things. This one, of course, is to scale. This is exactly what they look like in the ancient world. Uh, I carved this when I was a little boy and um, I'm kidding. Anyway, so anyway, I like these kind of things because they were originally used to help teach people, and that's they did, and they still are used for that way for people to learn about the gospel story, and they're useful. The problem is with things like this oftentimes is they're just not as historically accurate as they could be, uh, depending on where you find them and so forth. Uh, but we'll use this as we think about the biblical story of Jesus to a degree. If we turn to Matthew. Uh, the birth narratives of Jesus are only in two Gospels, only two places in the entire New Testament, Matthew and Luke. And if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, it's the first Gospel. If you have it, say amen. Not yet, huh? Say amen, I hear you. <laughs> uh and I'm going to skip a lot because of time this morning. We'll skip a lot, but I want to, we'll slow down when we get to verse 18. But the first verse is really important because Matthew is telling us what he's trying to communicate in the significance of Jesus. And he says, this is the record of the genealogy or the Genesis. Genesis is a Greek word. It means literally right here, the Genesis. The birth, uh, the pedigree, the genealogy, the pedigree of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham. Matthew's goal in his narrative, all the way through the end of verse, uh, was it verse 20, all the way through verse 25, is to demonstrate that Jesus is in the king relationship of, in the relationship of the King David. He has a king pedigree. That's the word. That's what I'm trying to say. That Jesus is related to David. Now, you might not think that way, and I don't think that way. I don't think about genealogies much ever because they might just read as very boring. But many people around the world today, and it's certainly true in the ancient world, they cared a lot about where they came from. They cared a lot about pedigree and genealogy. Uh, your genealogy, your pedigree, demonstrated what rights you had when your relatives died 
what was inheritance, what was coming your way. Uh, it demonstrated your social status in life. It certainly mattered a lot of your royalty because royalty was typically passed down through the bloodline. Well, Jews were no different. Jews believed the same kind of thing. And so when you're trying to demonstrate that Jesus is the Messiah, a Messiah is a kingly figure, a kingly royal figure. And virtually all Jews that believed in a Messiah believe that the Messiah, the kingly figure, would be in the lineage of David. That is, he would be genetically related to David, King David, who ruled about, well, almost 800 to 1,000 years before Jesus was born. It's kind of hard to date, but because of various promises in the Old Testament, they believe that the king or the Messiah will be related to King David, the, the end time king. So Matthew's trying to demonstrate that Jesus is in fact related to King David. He does that by giving a genealogy and he breaks it up in three sections. I'm going to go this real quickly too because I'm going to skip over on purpose. He says, so and so is the father of this, the father of this, the father of this. Now G um, Abraham um, is the, the first, the progenitor, because he's the original uh, person of promise, as it were, that God uh, set up a new people group to set to right what was made wrong through Adam and Eve's sin. Matthew sets up three groups of 14, and in the end of verse, uh, we'll start, I, I'm gonna do, we're skipping ahead on purpose, in verse 15, Verse 15, Eliud, the father of Eleazar, or Eleazar, the father of Matham, Matham, the father of Yaakov. Now listen, and Yaakov, or Jacob, and Yaakov, the father of Yosef, or Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who was called Messiah, or Christ. Jacob, the father of Joseph, or Yaakov, the father of Yosef, the husband of Mary. That's very weird, because in the genealogy, it's about who's the father, who's the father, who's the father. When we get to Jacob and then we get to Joseph, when we get to Joseph, we it veers to the left or right because now it's about uh, being married to someone. This is Matthew's way of trying to articulate to us how it is that Jesus can be in the lineage of King David even though he's not related to Joseph. Joseph is in the bloodline of King David but Jesus is not related to Joseph. What Matthew's going to demonstrate here in this narrative, which is what will make sure we hear, not so much a Christmas story on TV, what Matthew's trying to articulate to us is that Jesus, in fact, is worthy of being called the Messiah because he is related to King David, and he's related to King David not genetically through Joseph, but by adoption by adoption through Joseph, because Joseph married Jesus' mama. He married Mary, of course. And that's why it's still kind of a curveball when he says, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. So in this next narrative, what Matthew's going to do is defend the case. Matthew's going to demonstrate that Jesus was adopted. It's, it's implied in the text that Joseph was his adopted dad, and that still counts in the ancient world. It still counts to be related that way. That's important, remember, because Matthew wants you to hear the fact that Jesus is Davidic descent. He's Davidic lineage, even though it's by adoption. So this next narrative where most Christmas stories commence is really part two. Part one is the genealogy that Jesus is the Messiah, son of David, related to David. Part two, verse 18 to 25, is Matthew's explanation or defense of how it came to be that Joseph adopted baby Jesus. How did he act like the daddy? And so that's the one thing. He's, he's Davidic descent. He's king. Two, it explains to us in the narrative uh, that something else is special. It's not just that Joseph adopted Jesus, but why he did. And as we'll see, he, he adopted him because he was commanded to by the angel uh, to do so. So <clears throat> we'll see. Now, there's so much more to be said there, and it's interesting study. It, I think it's interesting study, but we're going to skip ahead a little bit to verse 18. So look at Matthew 1.18. So 
So verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ happened this way. Now, technically speaking, in Matthew and in Luke, the birth of Jesus is never described. We actually don't know exactly how Jesus was born. I mean, we know that how babies, where babies come from. I mean, in that sense, how it happens. But I'm going to, in the narratives, we're never told exactly when and where it happens. We're not. Not even in Luke either. And we'll talk about that later on when we get to Luke. Not today, but later on in a few weeks. But really what Matthew and Luke have in mind is describing to us the characters and events surrounding the birth of Jesus. So it happened this way. While his mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. In the ancient world, people got married for various, uh, really for one reason. I mean, they, got, they married various people for really one reason. It was a business transaction. It really was. They had a contract. Now, you could marry different people, uh, uh, usually in your same social status and peer group. So Jews typically marry Jews and Egyptians marry Egyptians, things like that. And you might use really a lawyer to make the contract, uh, depending on which region of the, the country you lived in. But they did come together and form contracts. And so a family would meet with another family and they would come together and decide how much the, the bride is worth. And the dowry, the money that went along with the bride, she came with money ahead of time, like a, like a bridal shower. Uh, she was given cows or goats or whatever to take to the marriage. And the more the more beautiful she was, and especially if she were a virgin, she got a lot more money that came with her. And one of it's for to help the newlywed couples make it. The second reason you gave a dowry is it very it dissuaded people from getting divorced because if it wasn't her fault, if the man just wanted to divorce her, he had to give all the dowry money back. And so they, they signed up contract to figure out how much the dowry was. And the main goal of marriage in that business contract really was to have children. That's the main goal is you have children, which is why the sign for marriage was sex, was intercourse, because that's how you had children, of course. And that's the main reason why they had marriage in the ancient world, is you had babies. In the ancient world, they didn't know that men could be sterile and not ha be the, could be the cause of why you didn't have children. They always blamed the women. It was always something wrong with her oven, as it were. They always blamed her if she were barren. Uh, so the, that's why sometimes if the women couldn't bear, they would try to go to someone else like Abraham and Sarah in Genesis, of course. But they came together, they formed the contract, and as far as we can tell, the tradition is they lived apart for about one year. They might live in the same village, they might not live in the same town, they usually lived close to each other, uh, fairly close, but one year they did not come together, which means they did not have sex, they did not spend any quality time together, roughly for a year. After the year was up, the contract took in force, and then they would, the man would go get her and take him to his home. They would have a ceremony, depending on how wealthy they were, or how long the ceremony lasted. They'd go back to his house, and they'd live in the father's home. Well, you did not at all do anything sexual. If you did anything sexual at a time, it was, to, it was, it was a sin. Now, today it's different. I want to make sure we draw that contrast, because we will, I don't want to take to the text something that's not there. In today's American culture, by the time you get married, most people uh, in American culture have had sex for a long time, months and months, if not years. They usually live together. They've done a lot of sexual things. In the Bible, all sexual activity outside of marriage, heterosexual marriage, is an egregious sin. It's a very terrible sin to do anything sexual outside of marriage. So in the ancient world, they took that very seriously, and so they didn't do those things. And if you did do those things at a time, you had to get married immediately because that was the act of marriage, unless you were raped, and then they did, of course, to get married then. You kept strict distance. And then, but if someone did, if someone did get pregnant and had sex before marriage, you had to call off the engagement or betrothal, which was a ceremony, you had to get divorced. It's not like today where you just take off the ring and throw it at the person. <laughs> it, uh, you had to get divorced. And so that's what's going on here is that Matthew is saying Mary and Joseph were in that, they were engaged, they were betrothed, but they had not come together in complete marriage yet. And to do that, uh, they had to wait the time. They would have had to wait. And here they said they were, before they came together, which means they did not have sex yet, uh, she was found to be pregnant with the Holy Spirit. Now Joseph knows where babies come from. So when, baby, when, when Joseph finds out that she's pregnant, he is 
legally bound to divorce her. And let's see what he says here uh, in the next verse. Uh, verse 19, because Joseph, her husband-to-be, was a righteous man, that means he knows the Old Testament law. He knows Deuteronomy 21, 22, 23. He knows that he has the obligation to divorce her because he's not the baby daddy. He knows that, but it says, Matthew says, but he didn't want to disgrace her. He didn't want to, he tended to divorce her privately or quietly. That's just because Joseph is kind. He could have gone around and told everybody in the village she's, she's uh, ruined goods. She, maybe she's a prostitute. Maybe she's whatever, but she cheated on me and I, I'm not getting married to her. He could have done that. But instead, he's figuring out, he's like, I, got, I need to divorce her because that's not my baby. And that's the right thing to do, certainly in the time period, that's the right thing to do. Uh, but I don't want to shame her. And so as quietly as possible, would people have known that they were divorced? Family would have, for sure. Uh, how much they told people, we just don't know. How much they would have told people, we don't know. But it would not have been a huge public event, according to this. And while he's considering divorcing her, which he and should have done, in that time period for sure. When he had contemplated this, an angel of the Lord, or can be translated as the angel of the Lord, appeared to him in a dream. Now in the ancient world, they believed that dreams were the a liminal realm. That is, it's like a, imagine a dream like a doorway in between what we might call the natural world and the supernatural world. Everybody thought that in the ancient world, that gods could speak through dreams. Gods did speak through various ways. One of the ways was dreams because it was in between those worlds. And so it was very common for people to say, I woke up and the gods gave me a message. Well, Jews were no different. Instead of God giving the message, God would send an angel, who of course angel means messenger, and then the angel would give the message. And that's what's going on here. <clears throat> Certain people apparently had the gift, like Daniel, of, of interpreting dreams and interpreting the divine message. So here an angel appears to Joseph in a dream and listen to what he says. So he said in the dream, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Now listen, Joseph, son of David, in case Matthew hasn't made it abundantly clear so far in the genealogy, Joseph is related to King David. Son of David means he's related to King David. So Matthew, remember, that's the point of this, this part of the narrative, verses 18 to 25, is to demonstrate that Joseph is related to King David. And Jesus is related to King David as well, which can, he, mean to be, he can be the Messiah because he's adopted by Joseph. So the angel says, jo Joseph, Yosef, son of Dawid, David, that's my humble name, do not be afraid to take Miriam, uh, Mary, as your wife, because the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So this is, this is uh, referencing that roughly year-long period, it's the angels telling Joseph, go ahead and finish off the betrothal. Don't be afraid. She doesn't have a baby daddy. She's not been sleeping around. In fact, she is pregnant, but she's pregnant via the Holy Spirit. Now, Greeks and Romans uh, had stories of the gods impregnating women, coming down to earth and having sex with women, and out pops half God, half man, half God, half woman, uh, like Hercules and so forth. The Jews did not think that. Jews never said that, never thought that, and this is not an exception to that rule. It is not saying that God had sex with Mary. Uh, sometimes you'll read skeptics online and whatnot and think this is, this is just like every other Greco-Roman story. Uh, anyone who says that has never read a Greco-Roman story, a Greek or Roman story mythology. In fact, what he says is conceived from the, or out of the Holy Spirit. And the imagery here is somewhat like, and for the Greek too, it's somewhat like the imagery in Genesis where the Holy Spirit comes upon or over upon uh, the waters of the deep, the waters of the deep in Genesis 1, verses uh, 2 and 3. And these, these references to the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary and then she has a baby is just a miraculous act. Obviously, that means there's, I mean, not to be crude about it, but there's no intercourse. There's no sex here. And it's very important to understand this is unlike the Greeks or Romans or the pagans, the nations. It's a Jewish way of saying God has done something miraculous, something very special. And is, it is genuinely unique. Of 
course, unique doesn't mean special. It means inimitable, without kind, without comparison. Uh, so don't be afraid to take her as your wife because what's been done to her is something never been done in the history of the planet, ever. That's difficult to explain. In fact, the text doesn't explain how that happened. Um, it, it doesn't. There's no, there's no technical description given. But in fact, uh, we're just told that's how it is. So don't be afraid. She's not slept around on you. The Holy Spirit, in fact, is the reason why she now has a baby inside of her. Verse 21, she will give birth to a son. And that would have meant that, would have meant that it would have been their firstborn son, which is the most authoritative heir in the lineage uh, for Mary and Joseph. And so that would have meant that over time, Jesus would have been the new uh, leader male in the family once Joseph dies. Now, historically speaking, we don't know when Joseph died. We know that in the, the narrative, Joseph disappears from the narrative, both in Matthew and in Luke, after these narrative of Jesus' birth. So by the time Jesus' earthly ministry takes place, there's no mention of Joseph. In fact, the text goes out of its way to describe that there was no earthly father. Later on, it will say things like, uh, isn't this Jesus and we know his mother and his sisters and brothers? They don't say we know his dad. And so it's probably the case that Joseph has died by the time Jesus has his public ministry. Again, we're not told that, but it's almost certainly the case that by then Joseph has been dead. So Jesus would have been the, the, the most authoritative male in the family uh, because of that. You're going to name a son, and you will name him, and it is you will, because Joseph, the father, names the children. They name the son. So Joseph knows it's his responsibility, and that's why he's telling him, you will name him Yeshua. Jesus. You'll name him Jesus or Yeshua because he will save his people from their sins. Now, let me pause there for a little bit. This is worth pausing on because it's his name. Jesus, the actual what it says in Aramaic and in Hebrew, you will call him Yeshua. Yeah, yeah for Yahweh is short for Yahweh, the covenantal name of God, Yahweh. Yeshua, Yahweh saves. So when Jesus was a boy, when he was a kid, all of his life, in fact, uh, his Aramaic family member, Aramaic speaking, Aramaic is not Arabic. That's what Muslims speak in the Middle East and so forth, and other people besides the Muslims, obviously, but that's the dominant language of, of Islam because the Quran is written in Arabic. Aramaic is different. Um, Aramaic means, uh, is a cousin language to Hebrew. It's very similar. So when Jesus grew up and his family the time period, they all spoke Aramaic, which was the language of Phoenicia and Babylon and so forth. And the language was uh, would have been Yeshua, Yahweh saves. Okay, uh, that's what it means. Yeshua, Yahweh saves, was as far as we can tell from archaeological evidence, was the sixth most popular male name of the time. So Yeshua uh, was a popular name. Yeshua comes through the Latin, through the English, as Joshua. Joshua. So Jesus's actual name, if we said it in English, is Joshua. Is Joshua. So before you throw your hands up and leave the church and quit Christianity because you've never been praying to the right person, I've been calling him Jesus all this time. I should have been calling him Joshua. Well, you can call him Joshua if you want. That's fine. Uh, so yeah, his name would have been Yeshua ben Yosef, Joshua son of Joseph. But when the Jews, by the time the Gospels are written, are outside of Jerusalem particularly, they don't speak Aramaic, they speak Greek. And so Greek-speaking Jewish followers of Jesus, they didn't say Yeshua, so that's Aramaic and Hebrew. What they said was Iesus. So Iesus is the Greek way of saying Yeshua, Iesus. Well, the Latin speakers later on didn't speak Greek, they spoke Latin. And so they Latinized Iesus to sound like this. Jesus, Jesus. So Jesus, the, the name Jesus is a Latin way of saying a Greek word, Jesus, which is a Greek way of saying a Hebrew and Aramaic word, Yeshua. Yeshua, Jesus, 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 they all mean the exact same thing. They all mean Yahweh saves. So you can still pray to Jesus. You can pray to Joshua. They know who you're talking to. That's, that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> but that's his name, Yahweh saves. What's distinct here, though the name is common, uh, what's distinct here is the angel tells Matthew, you're going to call him that because that's exactly what he represents. He will save, their, Yahweh 
saves, he will save their from their sins. So Yahweh saves. So Jesus represents Yahweh's salvation. This is really important to think about and understand because there's at least two major things this name represents, and it keeps us real clear and simple on our gospel message. One, it assumes people are sinners. And in the ancient time, in that time period, many, many Jews believed they were, in fact, in a state of sin because they were dominated by the Romans. They thought they were in exile. And the only reason why we don't have a free land and, and we're our own king, it clearly must be the case that we're sinning. And so, in general, that was the belief amongst the Jews in general. What's, of course, still true today, that both Jews and non-Jews are sinners. So it assumes that people are sinners. Not people who just make mistakes. They're good people who try their best because they're not good people. We're not good people, and we don't try our best all the time. We sin. So the name alone lets us know about who we are. People, uh, what kind of identity we have. And that is, we're not good people trying our best and so forth. <clears throat> we're people who need salvation. The second thing it tells us not only about who we are, but who he is. When you see Jesus and even hear his name, Matthew saying, and the angel saying to Joseph, you know that Yahweh saves. This person right here is in the saving business. And listen, man, I'm all about trying to answer questions for skeptics and people who have questions. I have a deep empathy for people who want Christianity to make sense. In fact, starting in January, I'm going to teach a class on evidence for Christianity. I'm all for that. I'm also for being real simple when we, when we can be about what the gospel message is. And the real simple message of the gospel message is that Jesus saves. That's two facts. One is you need saving and he saves you. You're sick, he's the cure. And that's exactly what Matthew's telling us, that he does save. Jesus saves. That's the message back then. That's the message today. It will always be the message. And you and I can be real clear about that message all the time. That's the message we hear. And so anybody can do that, right? You don't have to have any PhDs, uh, anything to say, Jesus saves. He saves people from their sins. It assumes a lot about you and a lot about him. And that's, that's good news. That's good news. That's good news. It's bad news that we're sinners. It's good news that he saves us. Amen? I said, amen? <laughs> amen. Uh, verse 22, this all happened so that what was spoken by the Lord to the prophet would be fulfilled. Fulfilled there means something like so that we would see a really, really good analogy. And Matthew's thinking, how do I explain the significance of Jesus? How do I do it in such a way? Well, I'm going to go back to my Bible, which we call the Old Testament, and he says, it's like the time this happened. Now, you need a little bit of context before we talk about what happened. And the time period, he's about to quote from Isaiah 7. In Isaiah chapter 7, something, a political uh, predicament is, is uh, being experienced by King Ahaz. Ahaz is in the south in Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel, where other Jews lived, Israel and then Syria above them. Syria and Israel want Judah to join forces to fight Assyria. The mean old bad, everyone hates the Assyrians. Everybody hated them. Well, Ahaz, down south, didn't know what to do. He didn't really want to go to war. And Isaiah shows up and says, do not join forces. Don't join forces with Israel. Don't join forces with Syria to attack the Assyrians. Don't do it. In fact, a virgin, well, uh, a, a young woman, a Parthenos, uh, Alma in Hebrew, is going to give a ba have, have a baby. Probably Isaiah's own baby, in fact. Isaiah's own son. So I'm talking about his own wife. When that baby's born... That baby will be a sign, and we're going to call him a nickname. In fact, there's a couple of nicknames given in Isaiah 7 and 8. Uh, but we're going to give him a nickname. His nickname is going to be Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. So listen to what Matthew says. So he's quoting now from that. Matthew says, this all took place to fulfill what the prophet said. And in verse 23, look, or behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will name him Emmanuel. Sometimes you see Emmanuel with an I in the front. That's the Hebrew spelling. If you see it with an E, it's the Greek spelling. Same thing. Emmanuel means God with us or God is with us. Now, that is very important to get. Very important to understand. 
what does Emmanuel mean and why, do, why does he say it? Just like in Isaiah's time, Isaiah saying, in Isaiah's time, when you see this baby to King Ahaz, this is the sign. Every time you see this baby, he's the sign that in a few years, this will all be over. He says that in Isaiah. He says, by the time this baby can eat curds and honey and so forth, this is going to be all behind you. So just trust me. When you see this baby, every time you see this baby, you know God has not abandoned you. Every single time you see this baby, you know that God is with you. He's with you. He's not abandoned you. He's not quit. He's not mean. He's not a villain. He is not for the bad guys. He's not on their side. He's on your side. Every single time you see this baby, you know that God the Father is with us. He's with us. Matthew said, it's like that. Matthew says, I know it was 750 years ago that Isaiah talked about that baby and his baby in his time period. 750 years ago. But it's just like that. When you see this baby, Yeshua, when you see this baby come, be born, and grow up, you know for a fact that we've not been abandoned. <laughs> I mean, I don't care who you are, that's stinking good news. That's what this is all about, man. This is what this this birth is all about. When you see that baby, you've not been forgotten. And you might be like me. I'm telling you, sometimes there have been seasons in my life I can go on for a long time. Oh, I can go on for a long time, a season of my life. And other sermons I will go on. I'll tell you more about it. When I really doubted whether God gave a rip. I mean, could care less about what I was going through in life. But Jesus. But the baby. I mean, that's that's exactly what evil doesn't want us to say. Every single time we go through a summer life, that's Matthew's point. Yeah, but... But Jesus, remember, Jesus is the sign that we've not been abandoned. Yeah, but I, he's not listening to me and God's not, I mean, my prayers aren't being answered. Yeah, but Jesus. Well, things are, I mean, I'm surely, surely Yeshua or Jesus must mean Yahweh wants me to be successful. He wouldn't want me to fail. No, that's not what it means. Well, surely when I see Jesus, it means I, I can't go through suffering or I will never be disappointed or people will never get sick. Nope, it's not what it means. It's not what it means. Well, if he were good, then uh, he can't be real. Well, he can't. I mean, all the nonsense we say, this reminds us, yeah, no, but Jesus. It's a fact. Jesus was born. He did usher in the kingdom of God. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead. He's alive and well. There's always but Jesus. Always, always, always. And when we see that baby, when we see him, or we acknowledge him, when we come to him every single time, he is always the reminder that God is with us. There is always a but Jesus response to whatever you're going through, whatever I'm going through, no matter what it is. And you and I can decide whether our fear, our panic, our worry, will decide for us what we believe about God's presence or we can let reality and truth and what it says here in the text to be what we decide about God's presence. You will meet Jesus face to face one day. You will. And a lot of the stuff we didn't understand, all, all the stuff we didn't understand, a lot of things we've gone through in life, they'll make sense then. Yep. But Jesus, we have him now. We don't have to wait Till then, before we get all of our all of our questions answered, before we trust him, but right now, he's with us. He's with us when you're scared. He's with he's with you at work. He's with you at home. He's with me with COVID. He's with whatever. It just doesn't matter. That's just true, regardless of what I feel. It's just true, and that's Matthew's story for us today. The narrative for us today is that it's like that. Matthew says. It fulfills, it really, it, that's the perfect analogy. It brings it to fruition. Just like Isaiah's baby, 750 years ago. When you acknowledge and come to grips with who Jesus is now, you need to understand who he is. It means you're a sinner and you need saving. That means God is with us. He's not abandoned you. He's not quit you. He's not on the enemy side. He's on your side. Now, what kind of God, what kind of God sends someone has a baby named Yahweh saves and God with us as a nickname is it a mean God 
Is it an absent God? Is it a rude God? Is it a God who can't wait to punish you and hurt you all the time? No. No. The gospel makes it clear, and later on through the story, and later on through all the New Testament, that the kind of God who is that would do that kind of thing is the God who loves you. Who loves you. Yahweh doesn't mean Yahweh punishes, though he can, and he has every right to do that, and he will for people who deserve it, absolutely. Ah, those who are not saved, yep, that's right. But that's not what it means. He's a God of profound love. This Christmas season, I wonder if you and I can help every season, encourage one another and hold each other accountable to say, man, I love Christmas trees, I love all that. Believe me, I think this stuff is so fun and cool. Uh, but we don't want the pageantry to get in the way of what it's all about. And Matthew is saying Jesus is the Messiah. He's the royal figure we always look for. He is related to King David. He's the Messiah God promised us. Two, the reason why Joseph's related to him is because he got adopted, but because an angel said, hey, 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 that's from the Holy Spirit. He's not a regular dude. He's going to save people from their sins, and he's still saving people from their sins. In fact, Matthew says in his sermon, and every time you see Jesus, remember, he's the proof that God is with us. Don't give up, friend. Don't give up. Don't this Christmas season. Stay true to the God who saves. To the God who saves. Now, in just a moment, there's going to be a video uh, from Bobby, our director of local and global outreach, and he's going to explain some about uh, global missions and, and local missions. And I hope you'll write down in your calendar ways you can get involved and, and prayerfully consider ways you can get involved here at Hill Church to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Uh, before we do that, let me say a quick prayer. And then uh, we'll go to that video. We thank you, Heavenly Father, so much, so very much for sending Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our Lord. Thank you that we know that we'll even just say your name, Jesus, or Yeshua, or Joshua. We're reminded that you save people from our sins. We need you. We need a Savior because we are sinners. And we're so thankful that you are still changing lives. You're still forgiving people. So very thankful for that. Thank you, Jesus. So glad that no matter what we might tell you or the people, we're so bad and we're so bad off. And if people only knew and all that nonsense that you'd take all that horrible, sinful corruption that we are and make us brand new creatures, new creations. And we know that when you come, Lord Jesus, even as, and as a baby, you are the sign that God is with us. Please remind us of that this morning and every day, all the time. That no matter what our feelings might tell us, we go back to the truth that you are with us. Back to the truth and reality that your coming to earth is the sign that you love us. You love us and you want to save us. Lord Jesus, help, it, help us accept your salvation. And we know to do that, we've got to surrender all. We've got to give everything up every day and deny our will and pick up our cross to follow you. So help us, Lord Jesus, do that. Help us surrender our all and give ourselves to you completely and receive from you your grace and your forgiveness. Of course, to the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have any uh, needs from the elders or anything I can do for you, at least from a distance, let us know. Email the elders, elders at hillchurchfamily.org, elders at hillchurchfamily.org. Or, of course, you can see uh, Elder John Swanson, Elder Justin York, Elder Dave Baum, uh, who are, of course, still at the church. Let them know how we might serve you, pray for you, even from a distance. We can always call our video chat. Of course, the other elders don't have COVID, as far as I know, and they'll be around, so let them know how they can pray for you. God bless you, and I'll see you next week.